I was trying to look for the song and I forget the title of it, but it talks about tempted and tested and uh, kind of an interesting song, but I couldn't find it in our songbook. But uh, somewhere along the line, I remember having sung it. But that's what we're talking about today. We began talking about Jesus is being tempted by Satan and uh, how important that is for us, that it shows the availability and the approachability of Christ. And by showing the approachability of Christ, it reciprocally also shows us the approachability to the God of heaven, that by and through Jesus being installed as our high priest and mediator, that gives us access to the Father. So with full confidence, we can go through Christ to the Father, lay everything before him. And that the Father has provided the Holy Spirit to serve as our intercessor. So in everything that we do or strive to do with regards to communication with God, he has provided for us to make it that much easier. As we deal with life with the temptations, um, he has provided Christ for us to show us an example in so many different ways. One of which is the fact that Jesus was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. We talked about Satan coming and striving to uh, subvert the faith of Christ. And he failed miserably. But he knew exactly where to approach him from. We talked about the polarizing effect that uh, Satan tried to do to separate the divine side from the human side. To get the divine side with full power to supplement the human side when the human side wanted something. The lust of the flesh, for example. After he had fasted for 40 days, command that these stones be made bread. Easily done. I mean, at lunch this afternoon, Janice thought she was being left out. So she's trying to command, bring me my lunch, bring me my lunch. But no lunch came for her. Because she just didn't have the power. No, she got lunch. It was all good. But Christ had the ability to, after 40 days of fasting, to turn the bread into our stones, into bread and eat, satisfy the lust of the flesh, the desire of the flesh. Well, Satan was not content there. The pride of life enters in in the second temptation, takes him to the pinnacle of the temple, says, if you are the son of God. And notice the first two. Notice the first two always started with the provocative, if you are, prove yourself. If you are the son of God. And that's what a Peru uh, appeal to the pride of life. We talked about that in such terms. Jesus indicated it was a temptation. But now let's go back. So let's go back into Matthew, the fourth chapter. And pick up where we left off this morning. Because now as we get into it, we're going to be into the fourth, uh, excuse me, into the third temptation. And the third temptation is dealing with the lust of the eyes. So go down to verse 8 of Matthew 4. Matthew 4 and verse 8. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. If only you'll fall down. Subjugate yourself to me. I'll give you everything. And I realized that in a sense, Satan thought it was all he has anyways. He thought I've got control over all these kingdoms. And I can grant it to Christ. But all he has to do is bow before me. The human side would look at it and go, yes. I long for all of that. For the notoriety, for the wealth, for, for everything. The glory, the honor. Because remember when Jesus came to this earth. Yes, he came as a human being. But although he was rich, Paul writes in the Corinthian letter. Yet for our sake, some translations have, for your sakes, he became poor. In other words, what he, what he did 
was he divested himself of being in that position of of fully in possession of of the divine nature not encumbered with this physical shell and he emptied himself into the form of man humbly lowly to walk to exist to be like us and then that part of him would scream out from the human side i want something more i don't want to simply be the the son of a of a carpenter I don't want that. I want more. Well, that's how most people would think. But Jesus was able to harness himself. He was able to overcome that temptation. Notice also that this temptation did not start with the challenge. If you are the son of God. If. This was simply open, straight out. I will give you. What will it take to have you bow down and serve me? What's it going to take? So you sit back and you think of of the things in the world. What would it take? What temptation would be great enough for me to, in essence, bow down before Satan. There's a story told about the crossroads in Mississippi. And that Robert Johnson, a famed blues musician, he went to the crossroads. And there he ran into, well, in this story, it's it's referred to as scratch, ran into Satan. And he goes, well, I want to be the best blues player there ever was. What are you willing to give in exchange for that? I'll give my soul. I'll sell my soul. And so that's the story of Robert Johnson. That he sold his soul to be the best blues player ever. Well, what's our temptation? What would it take for us? Because that temptation is there. That temptation is real. And as the saying goes, Everybody has a price. What's your price? And Jesus is, according to Satan, I'll give you all of this. But Jesus was able to overcome that temptation. So now the question comes back to us. Would we be able to do likewise? Would we have our fixation on doing the will of the Father? To the same degree that did Christ. That no matter what was placed before us. We would refuse it. We would not bow the knee to Satan. Even for a moment. Because that's exactly what Christ did. Not even for a moment. Would he agree to that. Well. Then you sit back and say, well, did Satan have the right to do it? To even to even suggest that he could give to Jesus everything. And I know we touched on it just briefly a few moments ago. But hold your finger here in Matthew 4. And then go over to John, the 12th chapter. And in John, the 12th chapter, drop down. Drop down into verse uh, John 12 and verse 31. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So by and through that is the indication that Satan does kind of sort of have rule over the entirety of the world. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul writes that Satan is the kind of sort of God of this age. Well, let's notice exactly how he phrases it. 2 Corinthians 4, and down at verse 4. And, uh, boy, this Bible just does not want to turn correctly. 4-4. In whose case the God of this world 
has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul in the Ephesian letter talks about Satan as being the prince of the power of the air. That's where our warfare is. It's with him. And Jesus shows us here. He shows us the way to beat Satan. And that is to have single-minded devotion. Remember, Satan is the father of lies. Has been from the very inception. He can't be trusted. And so when these temptations come, and they will come, they're coming from Satan. And he's looking for every way to beat you, to get you to subjugate yourself to him. But let's look at verse 9 of Matthew 4. Um, All these things shall I give to you. But look at verse 10, I'm sorry. Jesus said to him, now notice that this is said, and even the way it's written is indicating it is forceful. Be gone, Satan, is what he said. Powerful. Not just be gone, Satan. I, I, I don't want anything to do with you. No. It is emphatic. It is powerful. It is dramatic. This is what Jesus had to do. But what about us? Are we that forceful? Are we that are they are we that dynamic when it comes to overcoming Satan? And I think sometimes I don't I, I really don't think we are. We can be sold a bill of goods. Linda said some time ago, well, many years ago, we were at a car lot and uh, we were looking to buy a car. This is before we got hung up on Hyundai or Hyundai's on, on Kia's. Hyundai is the step up from a Kia. Anyways, we were on a car lot and a car salesman came out. And I was rather curt to him. And she said, You're rude. This isn't who you are. And I go, No, you see, he's trying to tell us stuff that that's just not right, and I'm not gonna have any part of it. Well, you don't have to be so rude. She was probably right, but that salesman didn't bother us anymore. We were able then to select the car we wanted. And we we're able to enjoy that car for a long period of time. Sometimes you have to be directed. And when it comes to Satan and what he's trying to get us to do, we have to be that way. Even if you go back into the book of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter. Solomon writes in regards to this. So again, hold your finger in Matthew because we're going to come back to it. Go into Ecclesiastes, fifth chapter. We're going to look at verse 15 and 16. Wherein Solomon writes, as he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils after the wind? So even though Satan may promise you the world, what good is it going to do you in the long run? You cannot take it with you. There's no shortcuts in life. There are absolutely no shortcuts. I'm reading a book now by a man by the name of Uh, Duggins and he he's a remarkable individual in high school he dropped out he he went to work doing the only thing he could do which was working nights in fast food restaurants cleaning them after everybody had left. He was grossly overweight. But one night he had an epiphany. And he said, I am going to be a Navy SEAL. And everybody laughed at him. 
I mean, here he is, gargantuan, no high school diploma, and he's going to be a Navy SEAL. He put his mind to it. He had that direction. He knew there was no shortcuts. He knew it. So he applied himself. He got into a strict regimen, mentally, physically. He said, I know it's for the long haul. And I know this is going to take time and energy and effort. He, exceed, he, he succeeded in what he wanted to do. And in the book, he's talking about you need to be committed. You need to have this, this eye of success. And you will not be denied. Anything in life is not going to come easy. You're going to have to work for it. I appreciate what Caleb's going through. I really do. It's not easy. He's running into some obstacles. He would like it, you know, if only this would happen. This door would open, that door would open. But undaunted, he's moving forward. I appreciate that. It took me forever, ever and ever to finish my schooling. If it wouldn't have been for Linda, I would have never done it. I had to go back and finish up some classes to get my bachelor's degree. And I said, okay, see, I did it. And she said, you're not done. And I go, uh-huh. She goes, you're not done. Get your master's. I am trying to raise a family, provide for them. And she's saying, go back and get your master's. I got my master's. I said, I'm done. She goes, no, you're not. You're not even close to being done. Get your PhD. It took me from 1968 to, uh, to 2000 to get my PhD. And if it hadn't been for Linda, I would have never got it. I would have never got it. But she kept saying, you can do it, and there are no shortcuts. And there weren't. Other than, other than, I was able to convince the school that rather than write up my dissertation, could I please just do it on videotape? Then they could critique it, they could transcribe it, whatever they wanted to do. And they said, okay, we're going to allow you that that uh, that that liberty. And so I went into the television studio, Adam doing the directing and technical everything. And eight hours, six, eight hours later, without interruption, I presented it, sent it in. I was surprised that they accepted it the way it was. The title of it, The Parasitic Paralysis of Psychological Seduction. That's what it was on. I was flying in the face of traditional psychology. That what we can find in the scriptures is more powerful than what the, what the religion of psychology puts forth. Because let's face it, psychology is a religion to the minds of many. There are no shortcuts in life. And you have to work to gain it. And so here comes Satan to Jesus. I'll give it to you all. And sometimes that happens in life. But we can't surrender if it violates the principles of Scripture. We can't. We cannot give in. The idea of I can have it now and not have to wait if that's what it takes doesn't work. Christ had to go to the cross to get what the Father promised him. He had to die on the cross. And his kingdom would be greater than the kingdoms of the world. That's what Daniel 2 teaches. And so that undoubtedly, undoubtedly has to weigh in Jesus' mind that day. I know I've got to go to the cross. I don't want to do it. And if I can have all of these kingdoms now, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
If I could have found a, a program that it would have given me a doctorate without having to study and, and look at other things, I'd have done it. I'd have done it in a heartbeat. But it wouldn't be worth anything. It would have been empty. It would have been vacuous. And people go, well, what do you do with your doctorate? Well, I do what I do here. I may not hang out my shingle like I once did. But I do what I do and I use it in a manner that I think is, is most productive. In teaching and preaching the word of God and in being accessible to people. But you don't need a degree to do that. You don't need a degree to be a friend. You don't need a degree to, to lend an ear. And that's the beautiful part about all that Christ went through. Some call him an itinerant preacher. He's much more than that. He's much more. And he's much more because he did not try to take a shortcut, even though Satan offered him one. And it was tempting. It would have to be tempting. Have to be. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, in verse seven, although he's a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having become perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. See how that plays in with his being tempted by Satan. He learned obedience. He learned to be able to overcome. Now go back into Matthew's account. Go back into Matthew 4. And notice what happens following this last temptation. Verse 11. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. He needed help. He needed strength. He had been through a lot. He had endured a lot. He had gone through a lot. He needed the care of those ministering spirits, as in some places they're called in the scriptures, to come down, to serve him, to help him, to aid him. So when Peter talks about be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He was trying to devour Christ. Here is the son of God. And after he's tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes and pride of life, he's given out. He needs strength. He needs bolstering. And you don't think you and I need that from time to time? But we don't communicate. We don't talk. We try to deal with it all on our own. Why don't we lean on one another? Yes, prayer is important. Absolutely. Cast our anxieties onto God because he cares for us. But realize that God put in something else. Second Corinthians, the first chapter, first several verses, talks about the comfort that we receive from God. But also that God put something in place in an immediacy. And that is the comfort we receive from one another. To be strengthened, to be, to be listened to. And one of the things that when you go and study to go into being a therapist, a psychologist. Is they tell you over and over and over and over again. Really what people really want to do is they want somebody to listen to them. I have a friend who's a psychologist. It's really not fair to call her a friend. Maybe at one time we were a little bit more in communication with one another. But Linda took one of her clients um, up to this individual who wanted me to go into, into practice with her. And one of the things about this therapist that I found really important 
was her willingness to listen to people. She is not a Christian. She lives a lifestyle that I couldn't agree with. But the one thing she is, is empathetic. And she will listen. And listen attentively. And that's why when individuals needed counseling and they needed somebody from a secular realm, I had no hesitancy of saying, go see her. I would always offer myself first. I'll, I'll be glad to counsel you free. Absolutely free, no charge. But just know I'm going to be talking to you from the scriptures. We'll deal with classical, but I'm going to turn it. I'm going to show you where there's a real answer. Some people just don't want that. I get a lot of calls every week about counseling because I'm, I'm on a website. But what people don't want is they don't want to hear the truth in return. And even though when they call me, they know they're getting a new theta counselor. They know that. Now, I realize that Southern California is unique. I know it. That we are totally different in dynamics and demographics, in attitude, than anywhere else on the in the United States. I know that. That people really are not of the mind to hear. But nevertheless, we still have to be there to listen and to respond. So when Jesus had gone through all this, he needed somebody to minister to him. We need one another to strengthen each other. We've been through a lot the last two years. Maybe you didn't get COVID. Nevertheless, emotionally, you've been through a lot. You've seen family members with it. You've worried that you were going to get it. You're worried about, should I get shot? Should I not get shot? What should I do? How should I do it? There's been that tension for over two years, two and a half years now. We've been through a tremendous time. And Satan has been working really, really hard. And we need to be there to listen in order to help. Care and attention needs to be there. So if, if Satan wore out Jesus, stands to reason that we can be worn out as well. Go back into the book of Ephesians, into the sixth chapter. And in the sixth chapter, passages we're very well familiar with, we're going to begin looking at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Stop there a minute. Sometimes it would be easier to fight an enemy you can see. It would be easier. If you can fight something you can see, then you can battle it. There's a thing called a snipe hunt. And a snipe hunt, there's no such thing as a, as a true snipe. But what you do is you convince an individual that we're going to go on a snipe hunt. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a gunny sack. And you're going to go out into this open field. Then the rest of us, we're going to go out into the hedgerows and we're going to push all the snipe toward you. And what you're going to do is they're going to run into the gunny sack and you're going to catch them. And so you take the person out into the dark and you put them out there and they all just leave. And there's the poor Rube out there, middle of the night, Holding a gunny sack, waiting. Oh, it's fun. I could see Austin on a snipe hunt, except I already told him what it was. 
But that would be fun. But see, what you're really doing, you build it up even more. And you talk about the unknown. And you get them in their mind creating the ferocity of, of a snipe. And they're willing to do battle. But the battle they're doing is the battle in their head. And it would be so much easier if there was really a snipe and you had a baseball bat or whatever. We're not on a snipe hunt. We are battling something that we do not see. But we do see the effects thereof. And that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. So you put on the full armor of God. Because you're going to be attacked in ways that you just wouldn't even begin. And it's going to come. And it's not going to be visible per se. Sometimes it might. But you're going to be tempted. Tempted and tested. In so many different ways. But look a little bit further. In verse 13. Because of this, therefore, as it starts out, take up the full armor of God, all of it, not just part of it, all of it, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Have you ever been shot by a paintball gun? When you get shot by a paintball gun, you know it. Uh, years ago, when paintball guns first came out, our boys and Tim Adams, John and Kathy's son, had him. Don Ashton had him. Brian Bird had one. Almost, almost every one of the young people at Lassen Street had him. And it was one night, and they were all kind of feeling frisky. They were out in the backyard, and all of a sudden, I heard a terrifying scream. Our oldest son had asked them to shoot him with a gun. I want to see what it feels like. Man, our son Jacob was an idiot. Because he came in with a huge welt. And I go, what happened? He goes, well, they shot me with a gun. I said, how did that happen? Well, I told him it would be all right. <laughs> Later on, when they would go on a field or go to a designated area, he got every bit of armature he could get. The elbow pads, the face shield. Everything he could possibly get to safeguard because he knew what it felt like to get hit with those guns. We know what it's like to get hit by Satan. So we want all the armature. It hurts. Physically, it'll heal. Emotionally and spiritually, maybe not so much. Take up the full armor of God is all Paul is applying here. Um, and he said, here's why. That you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. You want to resist Satan. Absolutely resist him. Because it's going to come. Growing up in the Free Methodist Church, there was a youth group uh, called the FMY. Free Methodist Youth. And in that, it was kind of like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts you would earn badges. And the badges you would earn were like the armature here that's talked about. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, uh, the feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace and so on. But it would deal with those things. And, and so what you tried to do was to earn those badges so that you would have the full armor of God and part of, of every badge was the repeating of this set of verses. I used to be able to quote it verbatim, but not so much now. He goes on to say in verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Sanctify them in truth, thy word is true. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. 15, having shod your feet in preparation of the gospel of peace. Then in verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. 
and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Here's how we stand against Satan. We take up that panoply of God, the armature that's there. And we hold on to it. We're going to be able to deflect whatever Satan puts our way. But if we don't have that in place, we're in exposure of being harmed. I especially like the faith, the shield of faith. That whenever something comes, you're able to ward it off. It was brought out years ago that if you'll notice uh, closely that this armor protects us as we're going forward. If you turn around to run, you aren't protected at all. You continue to move forward. We have Nerf guns in our living room. It's been a while since we had them out. But we'll sit there at night when we're bored. One of us will pull it out. And you'll hear it click. And then it's, we quote Isaiah. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no. You know, don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. But then Adam is the one who says it because he doesn't have one. (laughs) When I bought him, I only bought two. But then he'll get up to go. And it's then that we plant one right in his back. And that's so satisfying. Because he turns and runs and he exposes himself. Initially, he can hold up a pillow, you know, or whatever to deflect it. But when you turn and run, you can't deflect. When we lose sight of what we're to be moving forward with, we expose ourselves to the wiles of Satan. And we surely don't want to do that. So we hold on to the truth. We hold on to the gospel. We embrace the faith, which is found in God's word. Nothing more and certainly nothing less. Now we face similar temptations as did Christ. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. But here's where we benefit and we benefit greatly. We have Jesus. We have Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, who entered into the Holy of Holies for us. And how wondrous, how glorious that is. And we look toward him. Look at Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Therefore, after the writer had talked about the heroes of faith, Going on and saying, what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Yephthah, and so on. Then he comes to this point. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set to us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author of and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When Jesus was tempted, he overcame for you and I. He did not succumb because of you and I. Because if he had, he could not have been the acceptable sacrifice for us. Mankind would have been lost. Mankind would have been without hope. But by and through his unwillingness to surrender to Satan, even for a moment, on any one of the temptations, and they were very, very strident indeed, he did not succumb. He would not succumb. And like we said, there were other temptations he faced. Absolutely other temptations he faced. He could have got fried with with the disciples. He could have lost his cool with them. Could have lashed out and said any number of things. Kept himself in check. Can we say the same thing? 
Go back into the fourth chapter and look at verse 14. You can see it on the overhead or you can look at it in your scriptures. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are. Yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. That's the importance of Matthew, the fourth chapter. It's powerful. It's directed. To me, it's impressive. So I leave you with that lesson today. A lesson I hope that is encouraging. One that I hope is also insightful. That will allow you to stop, to reflect, and, and appreciate all the more what Christ has done for us. To appreciate what the Father has done for us, as well as the Spirit. To realize that by and through these shared experiences with Christ... He is more accessible to us than ever before. And by accessibility to him, we have accessibility to the Father. And we can find help in times of need. If you need the prayers of the congregation for strength or encouragement, we'd be glad to, to do that. To go to God on your behalf. As I look out, everyone here this afternoon has put on Christ in the waters of baptism. But you may be watching from home and you haven't yet put on Christ. I'd be glad to set a time up to study with you, to look with you from God's word to see what it will take for you to become a child of his. I know there is a slide that shows you how to contact me. And so pay attention when that slide pops up. Because I'll be more than happy to talk with you, to study with you, to listen to you, to your concerns, and to be of whatever help I can in accordance with the scriptures. And it's like